you know, I get asked a lot of time, how did you get into this and, and why are you as passionate about the environment as you are? And my answer is, many years ago, I was involved in a toxic tort case where I was gravely ill from a groundwater contamination. Uh, one of the men on my crew today is dead because, I say it's because of the contamination. The doctors will never agree with us on this, but we all got sick at Sloss Industries and now he's not with me. I sued the company because of the, uh, the impacts that I personally felt. In the lawsuit, there's a process called discovery where you go out, you get all the data. I went with the lawyers around this facility and looked at the, the impact to the community. It just happened to rain that day and there was black water running all off the coal pile down into the streets and there are these little black children out there playing in it. Come to find out in Discovery there's a huge cancer cluster all the way around this place. There, there's many, many documented cases of people who are uh, in some cases fatally ill. There, but during my lawsuit and in the discovery we found out that this particular company was uh, self-reporting discharge of ten times the allowable limits of cyanide into Five Mile Creek. Um, we we uh, settled the case but before we settled, I was told that I would have to sign a gag order. I wasn't going to be able to talk about this anymore. Before I signed the gag order, I took my whole file to a local environmental activist that I know, and I said, when I got my money, you need to sue these people. So he kept my files. After I got my money, um, they started suing them. We now have a long greenway on Five Mile Creek. The, for the most part, the cyanide problem has gone away, but there's still a lot of other issues. The EPA stepped in and found out that there's a huge plume of this stuff underground. It's benzene. There was a spill out there many, many years ago, and the EPA made a deal with this company that as long as you don't build any permanent structures on that site, you don't have to clean it up, and we will not call it a super fun site. Mm -hmm. This, combined with the children that I saw that were sick, it made me mad. I got angry, and I've been that way ever since. I get a lot of folks that want to call me a hero for what I did. I'm no hero. I'm a storyteller for the heroes on the streets. The real people who were impacted by this are the heroes because they survived it, they stepped up to the plate, they recovered, they, they kicked the dust off and went on about life. Those are the real heroes. I'm only a storyteller for those people. The for-profit medias today, um, they're governed by an editor who is governed by a board of directors who looks after the well-being of that media company. So if an oil company puts $15 million worth of advertising, say on CNN, then CNN is certainly not going to bite the hand that feeds them. They're not going to tell the whole story. I don't have an editor. You don't have an editor. Cherie didn't have an editor. We are our own editors and we tell the whole damn story. And that's how the real news gets out. We flew over the Gulf one day and that very morning Rear Admiral Thad Allen, who was a retired Coast Guard Admiral, he had no business in charge of that cleanup. He was a civilian giving orders to the U.S. Coast Guard. That was wrong. But he said, there is potential for oiling at the Chandelure Islands, but as of now, there is no oil in the Sound or on the island. 
my good buddy Tom Hutchings and I flew over there and we brought back pictures of oil everywhere. The beaches were covered, the booms were wadded up in knots and you could see the oil plume all out through the Chandelier Sound. Mm -hmm. I put that video up and that very same night Thad Allen came out and said that they were wrong about the oiling at the Chandelier Islands, that there was in fact oiling and it was significant. If we hadn't told that story, they would never have copped to the truth. And I'm not a journalist. I'm just a storyteller. And I'm certainly not a hero. Most of the really powerful environmental activists that I come in contact with today were not environmentalists by choice. They weren't environmentalists all their lives who grew into the activist role. These are people who were victims of environmental injustice, of pollution injustice, who were forced to come out and be voices for their communities. There, there's, there's a real disconnect between a for paycheck environmentalist and someone that's forced into the movement because of their their surroundings because of their environmental collapse and to me the most powerful advocates that I've ever worked with I was a, I was a chairman of the Citizens Coal Council for a great number of years all up and down the East Coast I worked on the Navajo Hopi reservations I've been all over the country working in the coal fields the most powerful activists I've ever met were never trained to be activists they were forced into the movement